A few weeks ago, I actually had an anxiety dream about tonight. <laughs> and in the dream, which was very intense, I was standing up here at the podium, but I didn't have my speech. I'd left my parents somewhere in Boston, and I had no shoes on. So I'm overwhelmingly pleased to be here, but I'm also happy to report that my parents are here, and I'm not barefoot. Tonight's invitation asks us to celebrate the power of the smallest gesture. I love this expression because it captures how little details have the capacity to transform experience. We all know this is true. Each of us appreciates the ripple effect of the tiniest action. Someone cuts you off online or on the road and you absorb that negative energy. Someone pauses to let you in literally or figuratively, and you carry that gift with you and ideally pass it on. And nowhere is this more important than in the relationship between doctors and patients. When we seek care, it is because something is wrong. No matter how small the issue, going to see the doctor is never as straightforward as taking one's car to the mechanic. Descartes notwithstanding, it is not easy to separate body and mind. If one's body is not working, one is broken in some way, and by definition, more vulnerable. To illustrate this, I'd like to share with you a few lines from a poem I often use in teaching. It's by Raymond Carver, entitled, What the Doctor Said. Imagine the scene, a doctor telling his patient he has metastatic lung cancer. He said, I'm real sorry. He said, I wish I had some other kind of news to give you. I said, amen. And he said something else I didn't catch. And not knowing what else to do, and not wanting him to have to repeat it, and me to have to fully digest it, I just looked at him for a minute, and he looked back. When I teach with this poem, I like to acknowledge that line. I looked at him and he looked back. Returning the gaze is one of those powerful, small gestures. It encapsulates empathy and compassion, being present, fully present, to another human being, pausing to look back, to say with our eyes that we are listening, that you are heard. I know the extraordinary potential of such a pause, of that small gesture myself. I am the mother of two sons, Ari and Jeremy, both born with significant brain damage, both severely disabled. For more than eight years now, I have been on the other side of the table, the recipient of care rather than the caregiver. Those who have connected with me on this journey or have identified strength or beauty in my sons have gone well beyond whatever treatment they've recommended or prescription they've written. And those who have not seen my sons, have not returned their gaze, have ultimately not cared for me or them in any way. Just one week ago, I stood in this exact hall and presented a lecture on the topic, primary care for breast cancer survivors. The longer I've practiced medicine, the more I've come to realize that we are all, as the years go on, survivors. For some of us, it is cancer. But for others, it is diabetes, or seizures, or kidney failure, or all of the above. And others are survivors of loss. Loss of a limb, loss of sight, loss of autonomy, loss of hope, loss of a loved one. And I have learned that many of us, like me, carry with us some secret sorrow, a loss or challenge that is not noticeable. Connecting with patients means looking for what is not immediately visible, listening for the whole in another's heart. I'm proud to be a primary care doctor. Primary care is focused on continuity, on knowing one's patients through all their illnesses and the complexity of their lives. 
and it is focused on prevention, on protecting you from the consequences of untreated but silent diseases and from unnecessary tests or hospitalization. It's care we all need and deserve. I look out tonight at a room filled with people who have the minds, energy, and position to change medicine, and I want to make it clear that primary care needs saving. And those who practice it need to be given the time to do it right. <laughs> primary care can save lives, your life but it cannot be done well in the tiny 15-minute visits to which we are held. There is no billing code for compassion. Please know that I have more thanks to express than I have time for. I would not be standing here tonight, the amazed, stunned, and thrilled recipient of this award, if not for the community that sustains me. I came to Beth Israel Hospital 15 years ago and stayed because I found a home there. My work, my mind, and my heart are supported by an amazing community of colleagues at Beth Israel Deaconess Healthcare Associates. And I have learned how to be a doctor in the fullest sense of the word from an extraordinary trio of mentors and teachers. Doctors Bill Taylor, Charlie Hatem, and Susan Block. I came to medicine because of the inspiration of my parents, who modeled intellectual curiosity, passion, and compassion. And I have arrived at this moment tonight because of my husband, Rob Cohen. Rob and I are indeed survivors, having endured not only the loss of our dream for a healthy family, but also the loss of our elder son, Ari, who died suddenly in 2006 at age four and a half. I have been able to find my way forward because I have Rob at my side, because although daily he and I travel a difficult and private path, I am not walking in this new world alone. I want to end where all this began, Kenneth Schwartz. Fourteen years after his death, his name is permanently associated with compassionate care and with programs that support it. We must remember his message, that even the smallest of gestures have in them the power to connect us to each other, and that connection is what makes the unbearable bearable. Trust me. I know. Thank you.